Um, welcome everyone uh, to this session, which is dedicated to, um, to peace research in troubled times. And this panel is sponsored by the European Peace Research Association. My name is Daniele Herrera from University of Catania, and I'm currently uh, the, the president of the European Peace Research Association. Uh, so this, uh, this panel is dedicated to uh, the future, let's say, of peace research in this contemporary, very, very difficult times. And we are exploring through the presentations. We have pre three presentations. Uh, we're expected more, actually. And unfortunately, and I will tell you why, unfortunately, in a second. Uh, but we have very uh, three very, very interesting presentations trying to understand what is needed in order to bridge the gap between theory and policy. And this is why we have chosen the title uh, to these, uh, these sessions and to see why uh, and uh, to what extent it is still very relevant uh, to enhance uh, peace research in these contemporary uh, times. And I was telling you, unfortunately, because one of our um, uh, speaker was expected to uh, to be here with us, and unfortunately, she has left. She has left us. So, Dr. Olga Vorkunova, who was also a member of the uh, UPRA board, unfortunately and suddenly uh, left us um, in, in in January uh, last year. Um, so, I. Uh, would like to say a few words about uh, Olga Vorkunova because I asked uh, um, Ari to uh, to be allowed to say a few words about Olga and just to also to to uh, label uh, the uh, the panel in order to uh, um, to remember her and to honor to honor uh, the, her memory. So um, Olga uh, was very active in the profession and a real institution builder. She was convener of trust and uh, so she was very in close contact with Johan Galtung, a member of uh, the UPRA board uh, and also a member of the International Peace Research Association board and the convener of the Peace Education Commission. Uh, she uh, was obviously professionally a giant member of the peace research community, uh, but I would also uh, to remember that she has um, strongly uh, contributed to UPRA events, initiatives, and uh, on a personal level, I also would like to remember that she was a very, very, uh, she was a wonderful person, a wonderful friend, a wonderful colleague, but first of all, a wonderful friend. And she has always supported uh, the association, but on a personal note, she has always supported myself. Um, and she was a sort of mentor for me in this, uh, in this specific field. So it was a, a huge loss for everyone. And uh, uh, she was expected to be uh, with us today. Uh, so uh, I hope that in the end, we at least can remember uh, and honor uh, her memory uh, in, in this panel. All right, so I will be, I will chair uh, obviously uh, this panel, but also uh, discuss uh, the, uh, the, 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 the presentations, although I see that there is a very nice audience, so many people, uh, thank you for joining us. So probably I will try to be very brief, or, or maybe I will leave to, uh, to the audience uh, because um, there are all uh, potentialities for a very good discussion. So I'm, I'm very happy that we have at least this chance to, to discuss. Uh, so shall I invite uh, the first uh, speaker with uh, Vidar uh, to, to start his presentation? Hello, Vidar. I know you have a PowerPoint presentation. So can you try? And I will try to uh, share it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not 100% certain I'm able to do this, but I'll try now. Uh, first, I have to find it. Um, there, I hope. Uh, are you able to see the? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, is it okay that I have it like this, or do I have to do this thing? Uh, I think it's fine. You it's can fine go there. on like that, Vidar. I think it. I see it perfectly. Okay, very well. Uh, just tell me if you don't. Uh, I don't. I I don't know how how long time I have. Uh, the problem is, of course, that I have too many images. Uh, 
Uh, uh, where Vidar, the, uh, well, I, I, I forgot to, to mention it in advance, but we have a very special panel because we have just three presentations, so probably we can have more time if Ari would allow me to provide more time. I know it's up to me, but I, at the same time, we have also received very strict instructions from the organizers. So, uh, you, you are, are the sovereign, Daniela. You are the sovereign in this panel. It's your panel. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have one hour and 45 minutes. So maybe you can uh, you can talk for 15 minutes okay. or 20 maximum, let's say. But I would recommend to, okay. have to stay in 20 minutes, if you can, obviously. Right. Um... It's good to have it like this because then I can jump past some of the images. Uh, first and foremost, uh, here is uh, just one figure uh, from uh, Evans, 1997, when, just when the internet broke through internationally, which said that now there is a real hope that you, we can learn to identify with the human race as such, not just with all the intermediary boundaries that surround us from family via group, nation to corporations. Uh, and uh, well, the world hasn't gone exactly as he thought. What I'm going to address is the problem of uh, how uh, intergroup stereotypes and prejudice can in a way be, be reduced uh, by intergroup contact. Uh, this is uh, a long-standing research that's been going on <laughs> globally since at least <laughs> 100 years back, but certainly quite a lot since 1945. And the classic there is Allport, the nature of prejudice, which it says has the roots in the habit of obedience, which we learn in childhood. And then, of course, group membership, which gives us uh, safety, uh, tendency to stereotypize us, them. Uh, we use mental shortcuts because that feels of identity. Uh, and uh, we are a bit intellectually lazy and lack uh, also courage. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a tendency that this us, them uh, situation continues even when we don't want it. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll not go into the question of, of, of stereotypes because uh, right now, because I think it is much easier to talk about that as a secondary issue, not the primary one. Uh, prejudice, according to Allport, was or is an aversive or hostile attitude towards a person who belongs to a group simply because he belongs to that group, and therefore is therefore presumed to have the objectionable qualities ascribed to that group. group. In other words, there are so-called positive prejudices and negative ones, but we'll talk about mainly the negative ones. Of course, a prejudice can also be, for example, a prejudice about a high elite group that everybody admires or very many people admire. Uh, for himself, uh, put it this way, by this quotation, it's being down on something you're not quite up on. Um, outgroup prejudices, uh, according to Allport again, is an antipathy based upon faulty and inflexible generalization. It may be felt or expressed, not necessarily expressed. It may be directed toward a group as a whole or towards an individual because he is a member of that group. Summary so far, it is an unwarranted conclusion a negatively charged stereotype or image of an outgroup combined with a faulty generalization or deduction, either from the group to the individual or the other way around, because you've met some objectionable <laughs> individuals from another group, or just horizontal. Um, hostility is not necessarily a consequence of coming concomitantly with prejudice. Hostility is a risk inherent in the relation between groups or individuals if the relation is built on suspicion or some sort of zero-sum competition over territory resources, etc. Uh, I disregard personality factors here, which of course can also create hostility. Uh, uh, 
hostility can easily be triggered against a group as well as individual members of that group if the perceptions are based on rank, subordination, fear, anger, contempt, competition over resources or values. Uh, now, what has been developed is what I now call the simple contact hypothesis, which uh, <laughs> in a very simplified way, says that the more we are together and know one another, the happier we'll be together, because then we know one another and we get safer because we know the other. The counteracting forces are many. And the main problem is translation from interpersonal to intergroup friendship or vice versa. Uh, and vice versa. Uh, counteracting forces are distrust among one's own in-group, like family community, vis-a-vis -vis the others. Because you know a person from the other group or know the other group, you argue that they are like us, but your own community don't accept that argument. Then there is the exception to the rule argument that you know that person, he is all right, but all the others you know. Deeply rooted beliefs about the deep culture of the out-group they can continue even though you know quite a lot of persons from that group. There could be biased beliefs about the causes of conflict and they may remain even though your friends, you are friends with people, many people from the other group. Then there is the problem in inequalities and then the social climate or context in which you try to connect to the other group. Uh, I'll, Brief, I'll jump, just jump over this because, um, uh, except for briefly on point number three, when conflict emerges, there's a tendency to stereotypization. Self-identity is then defined stereotypically as opposed characteristics to the other group. Then there's prejudice, ranking, opposition that tends to come together with these things when there is an upcoming conflict. Um, Quite a lot of experimental research has been done of, on the question of how and whether uh, bias versus outgroups are sort, sort of very easily triggered things in us as humans. I'll just refer briefly to some of these that are referred to in several articles by Gertner et al. Uh, and company, uh, who are really working hard with psych psychological experiments in th this tradition. Uh, there is, of course, the attribution bias. There is a tendency to have more sympathy and empathy for in-group members. There's more rewards given to in-group members if they do something good, uh, if they have the right solutions to a problem. We tend to have more care for common resources if we think that in-group members will be the recipients of those resources. There's different information processes. In-group members are more easily individualized, names and actions memorized. We're more forgiving when they make mistakes. And there's a desire, tendency to a desire to compete with the out-group. Uh, in a way, you could say there are then cognitive mirror images or negative reflections of one another when it comes to the in-group, out-group co uh, construction. Uh, positive or valued behavior or in-group members is then, as a tendency, attributed to cultural features of the in-group. While positive behavior of out-group members more frequently tend to be attributed to positive individual personality or personal factors of that member, not to the characteristics of the group. And then it's vice versa when it comes to negative behavior. And the same pattern goes for mistakes, mishaps, success, failure, etc. Uh, I'll just jump briefly over what everybody <laughs> in a way knows, the classical studies, the Robert Cave experiments, the Milgram experience when it comes to em empathy, and go to the question of two approaches then to build up, down or to reduce or perforate these boundaries between groups. One could be called the bottom-up uh, approach, interpersonal or personalized contacts via, go via cooperation, and then the intergroup boundaries became, become less salient or hard. Uh, in a way, um, and, and again, now I'm referring to Gertrude and company, 
they say there are three processes here. First, decategorization that perforate the group boundaries. You know somebody from the other group. Then recategorization, re you redefine and find common categories to which we both belong. We're say blue and yellow, but we're all, both green. And then we can actually differentiate mutu mutually if we say that we're both green. Like for example, uh, Northern Ireland used to say that we're both British and Irish and we're all members of the European community. <laughs> uh, now, uh, it is possible then, they say, that groups can perform complementary tasks and go into division of labor if there is this common, say, common identity to which we both belong. Uh, top down simply means that there is agreement made on the top level that is, you could say, legally binding, necessarily that, not necessarily that, but they are important. Then there is concrete exchange agreements on common projects between the groups. And then there's people to people contact that makes prejudice disappear or at least less salient. Uh, the process number three here is the same as the one I mentioned above. Personalized interaction and contact over time will then, we think, reduce bias of perceptions. Now I'll jump to the question that is actually the one I am saying I'm addressing. Do educational interventions to achieve these things work? Uh, I'll try to find it now uh, there. And I'm re I will re be uh, referring mainly to two kinds of projects. One is the Children's International Summer Villages, which has been ongoing since the 1950, around mid early 50s. Uh, started by uh, a woman called Twitchell, Alan, Alan I think. Uh, it has been evaluated, but un unfortunately, mainly by internal participants in the Children's International Summer Village organization, which means that external evaluations are actually almost not there. The evaluations done, nevertheless, are very, very positive. Interpersonal friendships across nations and groups could be are established with children, say nine to 12 to 14 years during three or weeks, four weeks summer camp, and they remain over life. They may remain lifelong. And the Children's International Summer Villages recruit new teachers and youth leaders from generation to generation now for about 80 years, uh, 70 years or so. Uh, the problem is, of course, that the effect on intergroup and international relations, uh, and especially when it comes to conflict, is unknown. Uh, my question is, is this peace education in a can, in a way canned, so it doesn't interact with the open environment that creates the risk I mentioned above? Um, uh, then there is quite a lot of research done on educational interventions to create better relations between Jews and Palestinians in Israel and the West Bank. Uh, and I uh, knew uh, Gabriel Solomon. He was, um, was teaching at my university several times. Uh, and I'm referring mainly to the research done by him and his uh, rather large group of researchers here now. Uh, 2002, they were done meetings, uh, encounters between families from both sides, Israeli and Palestinian, or Jews and Palestinians. Uh, it was a one year long program to develop information about one another's cultures and customs, where they met to have dinner in one another's houses, discussing what they like, etc. And these people found out that they were actually could become very good friends and could recognize themselves in the other. They could make friendships. Uh, the problem is that this was about the time the Second Intifada started, and it broke down due to that, or due to the conflicts that then developed. Uh, I don't know whether it was resumed or not, but when the conflict broke out, the program in a way stopped by itself. Uh, you could say that there was increasing distance, but 
they did a post experiment investigation and they found out that the distance was smaller with less distance in the participant group than in the control group so in the control group those who had not participated the prejudice was harder and more intense than in the um, group that had participated in these uh, meetings with families from the other side uh, of course there's always a risk of relapse uh, because perceptions of one another will vary with conflict intensity. Then there is the near school of heart of the heart. It's a very well documented project with joint Israeli Palestinian Jordanian education of, of heart uh, doctors. 60 students, students, 20 from each cultural group, staff made out of, uh, made up of both Israeli Jews, Palestinians and Jordanians scientific orientation towards medicine, proficient in English, they were all that. It was intensive two weeks course, just one in Israel, one in Jordan. They were living together in dormitories, learning goals were heart medicine. Note, it was not necessarily to become friends. It was to learn something common, a common skill, if you like, plus advances in technology. Uh, the outcome, was simply that these people worked very well together and they were very well able to both see through the differences between the groups they are were in a way we're both we're blue and yellow but we're both green and we can do the same we can cooperate uh, then the question uh, here that comes up is was this because they were studying something else than their conflict well, Schechter and Lustig did two very interesting different experiments. Schechter asked, does identification with suffering make, make us more em empathetic with the other side? The test was visit to concentration camps from World War II, what in Israel has been called the march of life. Um, the argument for this is that if we're close to the suffering, if we sense the feeling and pain of the other, seeing the world from the other person, person's perspective, then our empathy, ability to put ourselves in the other person's shoes will increase. Lustig asked, does, could we say the opposite, that distance affect our empathy? He let his students study a remote conflict that in Northern Ireland, and then afterwards they tested whether that had affected their view of the other side in the Middle East conflict. Uh, I must say that mainly the results here are from Israeli students aged something like 16 to 18, upper secondary level. Um, the result from Shekhar was, Shekhar was that, and here is a very interesting de detail. 309 11th graders, pretests on attitudes to human rights. Results, there was a group of more hawkish attitudes and more dovish attitudes. To, so they, they divided into hawks and doves and then randomized them so that half from each group went to the concentration camps and the other half were not going there. Uh, this is a, a little simplification of what happened, but it is the main point. The hawks showed strong empathy with the victims. And they also sh showed strong power and pride in being Jewish. It had no bearing on their empathy with the Palestinians. The doves, who were then more you know, universalistically human rights oriented, they learned a universalistic lesson. Their empathy for the Palestinians increased. Uh, but there was all over a greater understanding of the Palestinian plight which is also an important detail here. Unfortunately, empathy in the cognitive sense didn't necessarily have too much bearing on how you empathize with their way of feeling. Their perspective, if you like, as being in the situation they are in. The details, Salomon, uh, Lustig, let the students simply study a distal conflict 
and see what bearing or effect that had on the view of a proximal zone that is in the Middle East itself. Uh, learn about the conflict in Northern Ireland. Subjects were naive Israeli high school students, 16 to 18. Context, NGO educational project, not state project. Out of school. School signed up in a way. Um, Palestinians withdrew, so we only have the results from the, Jew, from the Jewish side. Because, why? Because there was an intifada ongoing of some sort. Sorry, I don't remember exactly all of them. Uh, and then uh, the tests here were simply a pre-post-test questionnaire, tapping understanding of the others, point of view, measurement of effect of the intervention, tapping Israeli views, Jews' attitudes to Palestinians, and vice versa. Uh, uh, ability or willingness to write school essays seeing the conflict from the other side. You have to write a school as essay seeing the conflict from the Palestinian side. Uh, pretend you are the other, write an essay about the conflict using the I, we form. Uh, results were, and this is just a simplification again, because there's <laughs> results. <laughs> But the results is simply that the group that was exposed to the intervention were more willing to write an essay. They had more so-called positive or words like compromise negotiation. They had less negative words like deport them, death, war. And they were 88% were able, at least cognitively, to see the conflict from the Palestinian perspective. Uh, but there was an alternative. Some were able, many, unfortunately, were able to see the conflict from a third person perspective as detached. Uh, I'll come to the conclusion now. Uh, uh, simply lessons learned. Yes, interventions tend to work, but they can in a way be, if not annulled, then the effects can be stopped when political conflict emerges, or when, and this is import, important, when political leaders decide <laughs> that they will go to conflict. Uh, according to Solomon, and this is a reference to an, a lecture he ha ha had in my university, he gave in my university, he said that we have, the problem is that we tend in our projects, educational projects, to just, just uh, put our fingers a little bit on the more peripheral beliefs about one another and not the core beliefs about ourselves and the other. Here he says, is how he said, is how it is in the Middle East. The Jews talk about the Holocaust, the Palestinians about the Nakba. Jews, survival, only one safe home, Palestinians, that means for us killing deportation. Jews talk about war or liberation, Palestinians call it occupation, land theft. Jews talk about independence from colonizers, uh, Palestinians talk about Israel as a US or EU bridgehead. Uh, Jews say never again, Palestinians say never again. Uh, the problem around this is that we have to start dealing with the core beliefs, according to uh, Solomon. Unfortunately, shortly after he had these lectures, about five years later, he died. He deceased. <laughs> so he wasn't able to complete this project, but I'm referring this because I think it's very important findings. And the problem is, of course, that the power structures are always moves, moved most strongly by those who, who govern the society and they also govern the educational system. And it is very difficult for me to see how individual projects outside of school can affect whole generations, which is the idea of education as different from just accidental intergroup contact that leads to better relations between me and you, me and an accidental other group, like, for example, the Children's International Summer Villages have done. 
The problem is that at the end of the day, it comes back to politics. <laughs> uh, not because education doesn't work, because it does, but the question is how can we make curricula and methods in the ordinary schools of a society that counteract these prejudices in a more in an effective way and not just accidentally as the project I've referred to now. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Vidar, for this fascinating presentation, also for opening uh, you know, several questions about how we should and could uh, teach uh, peace or also promote interactions among students from different backgrounds. So I, you make me remember something that, uh, you know, <laughs> recalling something that I experienced experience with my very international classes of students, also especially in Bishkek, uh, when it comes to, you know, Afghan students, particularly and recently. So, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, can you please uh, uh, stop sharing your screen? Yeah, that? sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's okay. Stopping now. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we now move to the second speaker, Itir Toxos. Please, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello from Istanbul, uh, which is on its first kind of snowy day. So we today look more like Tromsø than Catania or Jerusalem, to be honest. Uh, but here we are with some snowflakes outside of my window. Today, I will be talking about uh, science and pseudoscience in times of a pandemic. Uh, whether there is a peace research perspective on this or not. Now, let me first of all share with you my PowerPoint screen. Now, first of all, I think it's very meaningful that this uh, panel uh, was uh, sort of dedicated to uh, Olga Vorkunova, our friend and colleague. Uh, and the reason is that Olga was always very supportive of the track I chose um, to go towards some research in science and technology studies in international relations. She would oftentimes give me some recommendations or send me resources and things like that. And I really feel indebted to her to have all the constructive um, support that she had given me over the course of the years. Now, I just would like to start by giving you an overall picture. Now, when we look at the world between 2016 and today, basically, present day 2022, uh, in the press, uh, many of us talked a lot about these following topics. Now, we talked about the first election of Donald Trump that he won in 2016, and then the one that he lost in 2020, uh, the Brexit campaign and its aftermath again in 2016, and the role of Cambridge Analytica, um, the company that sort of harvested personal information and uh, manip sort of kind of manipulated the electoral security uh, in some of these elections. Then came post-truth, the word post-truth, which the Oxford Dictionary uh, declared as the word of the year in 2016. And of course, during this time, coupled with post-truth, fake news became one of the words that we started to see very heavily in our newsfeed on social media, in mainstream media, on television, newspapers, and so on. Uh, and, of course, there was also a lot of debate on social and political polarization, alt-right groups, ultranationalism, and the policy of isolationism, especially as a policy of foreign, uh, foreign affairs. Then uh, the social media and their impact on, uh, on the society and on politics was uh, debated heavily. The topics surrounded the echo chambers, trolls, bots, and the unintended consequences of uh, social media. And then came COVID-19 at the end of 2019 and in 2020, it was declared a pandemic basically. Now, this looked like a world where information, knowledge, and truth was at risk. And when the pandemic came, uh, these were kind of what we needed the most. Now, is truth ever possible? If you look at social uh, sciences from, let's say, a postmodernist or a constructivist perspective, 
this is another question for you, of course, but facing uh, factual problems like climate change, like a pandemic made people uh, question these uh, issues even more. Uh, a lot of people thought that there was a knowledge pollution or an information pollution in the world. And actually it boiled down to the issue of uh, information security. Now, this whole overall picture is actually very much related to three main uh, issues that I would like to focus on, the conspiracy theories, pseudoscience and infodemic. Actually, I used the word pseudoscience in my title, but it is like science and pseudoscience. It made a little bit more of a rhyme as a title. But when I mean pseudoscience, I actually include all of these, although I know that this is not the umbrella item. Now, we also, during this time, started to see more conspiracy theories being shared, like flat earth, climate change presented as a hoax, uh, the COVID-19 being presented as a Chinese virus. And then when the vaccines came, then we saw a world which was severely polarized between those who just rushed to the hospitals to get their vaccines whenever they could, and those who still dragged their feet in order to not get vaccinated. Then again, the pseudoscience of the anti-vax research, homeopathy, certain theories on race and so on, especially coupled with the policies or the rhetoric of the alt-right groups and the ultra-nationalists came to the fore. Um, the World Health Organization even acknowledged during this time that we were going through not only a pandemic, but also an infodemic. That is a portmanteau verb for um, information and pandemic, which means the spread of uh, non-correct or wrong information. And on Sanders' end, we can actually uh, distinguish three types of uh, infodemic problems. One is misinformation, which means you can share something without knowing that it is wrong or you can report something without knowing that it is wrong. It's not deliberate, it is done by mistake. Then there is malinformation, which is done in order to tarnish a person's reputation, sort of like gossip, rumors, and so on. But this is on the personal level. And then there is disinformation, which is generally qualified as deliberately manipulated information, which is put out there for some kind of negative public or political end. Now, maybe in the past we used to call this propaganda uh, and we named it by other, by other concepts, but today I think this information is the, is the more correct usage of the term. Now, these are kind of the categories on the sender's end and on the receiver's end, the infodemic uh, pointed to certain other problems. For example, there was an overload of information and the people really did not know how to distinguish right from wrong, or they were overwhelmed by this overload of information and they just took certain news at face value. Then, of course, the cognitive biases of the people and their political uh, views, and especially the impact of political polarization came into uh, into um, effect. More and more, we also started to realize that maybe even the most educated of us uh, lack in scientific literacy. When we talk about um, viruses, when you talk about our biology, when we talk about more scientific matters, we have started to realize how poor our, let's say, high school information um, is right now when we are grown-ups. And of course, the mistrust of whatever there is mainstream, be that political authorities, journalism, academia, this started to show as well on the receiver's end. Now, as I said in this paper, the term pseudoscience actually includes all of the above, the conspiracy theories, the pseudoscience, and the infodemic. And I just said, not because it actually does, but all three are in fact interrelated. Uh, 
And then when we look at the case study of COVID-19, we can see that the origins of COVID-19, for example, they have been subject to a lot of um, a lot of conspiracy theories. Some thought of COVID-19 as a bioweapon. Some thought that because Bill Gates had invested uh, money and energy into propagating about vaccines in the past, he had some kind of interest in fabricating a virus like this. Then uh, there were conspiracy theories that uh, the 5G technology, which is a cell phone communications technology, had some kind of uh, an impact on the rise of the COVID cases. And some even claimed that this was uh, the project of some mastermind uh, for population control in the earth, especially targeting the elderly and so on. Uh, there were also conspiracy theories, pseudoscience in infodemic issues about the measures and the policies on COVID-19, about whether we should wear masks or not, what kind of masks we should wear, under which circumstances, the same thing for social distancing, the remedies like the medications being used or other types of, um, let's say, remedies. In Turkey, for example, there was one doctor even who thought that uh, drinking pickle juice was good for <laughs> curing COVID-19 or protecting yourself from COVID-19. And then whether the lockdowns uh, were actually prevention for prevention of the virus or for um, stripping people of their civil liberties. And then uh, about a year into the, uh, not even a year, less than a year into the pandemic started, the vaccines came along. Then we started to talk a lot about vaccine safety and whether the people could be forced to take vaccines or not. So this became an issue of personal freedom for some as well and led to further um, disinformation, misinformation and conspiracy theory cycles. And all of this actually snowballed. So one aspect of the story, uh, let's say, fired the other one. Now, there was more focus in the press. There was more focus in social sciences on these issues. And there was more academic research in several academic fields. When I say these issues, I mean conspiracy theories, pseudoscience, and uh, and the uh, infodemic, basically. Uh, I have seen uh, most of these issues being dealt with under communication studies, psychology, sociology, political science, and international relations, but also hard sciences like epidemiology and so on. So this is actually one area where we have seen some of the arguments from hard sciences and social sciences come together. And then I started to wonder how about peace research? Uh, what does peace research say about this? Now, I'm going to explain and make my case after I give the evidence, as which doesn't exist, by the way, unfortunately, in peace research. Uh, I will tell why I thought that peace research would have something to say about this, but um, I wouldn't say to my surprise, but maybe not to that extent, I found close to nothing. Now, certain reminders about peace research. Peace research focuses on individual and groups as individuals, as the major actors. Peace research thinks that individuals and groups uh, acting together, uh, they can make a change for the better in world politics. This is an interdisciplinary field. It is actually a highly normative field because it is value oriented. Now, I first started with a simple Google research. I just wrote several keywords into Google, uh, such as peace research, pseudoscience, peace research, infodemic, peace research, populism, and these kinds of things. And I found almost nothing, nothing. It was like the internet was silent on this. And then I thought, okay, the peace research is not a mainstream topic that we see in, like it is not labeled as such in mainstream media. So maybe in the journals, I would find something. And of course, since this whole debate started around heavily in 2016, I thought maybe from 2016 on, I would be able to find 
um, research on peace research uh, journals about this. Uh, and uh, of course there are many, and I just recently started to look into this. Uh, this is going to go on by further uh, investigations onto other journals in peace research as well. But I covered all the issues of journal of peace research all the issues of Journal of Conflict Resolution and all the issues of Journal of Peace Education since 2016. And well, let me tell you what I found. I found nothing about all of these different topics that I have mentioned. There is no article in any of these journals which even slightly touch onto the topics that I discussed. There are a couple of articles, which, for example, in the Journal of Peace Research, I found one article in 2018 on media technology, covert action, and the politics of exposure. But inside the article, there didn't seem to be problematization of the what, whatever was going on since 2016. In like Journal of Conflict Resolution, there was an article called Adverse Rainfall Shocks and Civil War, Myth or Reality. But when I saw the word myth, I was like, okay, maybe there is something that talks about these. But actually, I just thought that I was being very stupid because I focused on the word myth. And then it was only in the Journal of Peace Education, I found two articles which could relate to topics of science and the role of science in peace studies. One was Peace in Science Education, a literature review, which came out just last year in one of the latest issues of the Journal of Peace Education. And then there was a book review on uh, Einstein's pacifism and the First World War, basically. And there is nothing more, nothing else. The peace research has been silent about these. Now, that means that actually we need to get out there and start doing research about these issues. Um, the issues of science and pseudoscience are actually at the heart of state security, international security, human security, and migration, especially in the area of migration, the amount of disinformation about the migrants is enormous and it makes a huge damage to the policies of many countries. Issues of justice, um, both negative and positive peace, peace education, peace journalism, these are all actually areas that are related to the issues of science and pseudoscience. Now, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, as you know, was given to two journalists, uh, one from the Philippines and the other one from uh, Russia in 2021. And the basic idea was that these people were after the truth. So the truth and the seeking of the truth was the basis of the Nobel Peace Prize the previous year. And that is how it is relevant as well, the truth and what science and pseudoscience contribute or strip away from this. Now, when we look at interstate conflicts, especially, for example, the debates about global power transition, uh, we can see that the China versus United States uh, is an issue. And a lot of this conflict uh, also takes place in disinformation uh, settings. Electoral politics, the election security, the 2016 US elections, Brexit again, 2020 US elections, and the following January uh, 6th events last year. Uh, then environmental security, public health, issues like COVID, vaccine safety, big pharma, and actually the topic of inequality, African-Americans and trust in medical sciences and so on. These are all issues that could be dealt with under a peace research agenda, which are not. By the way, I must admit that I was also very surprised that in none of these articles, there was any article on inequality, which is again, very surprising given how much um, relevance there is to peace studies, but there is no mention of inequality. In the last six years, 
in, let's say, the prominent leading journals of peace research. So um, what does it do when we leave ourselves uh, to the dangers of pseudoscience, infodemics, and conspiracy theories? Now, first of all, this atmosphere erodes trust in the societies, it intensifies crises, it hinders and obstructs real solutions, Therefore, it prolongs the problems and delay their solutions. And because it delays their solutions, the problems which already exist become uh, more costly to resolve. And they have snowballing effects. So uh, any kind of information problem in one area snowballs or spills over to the other areas. So peace research agenda on science and pseudoscience needs to be developed. And that means that we also need to bring the interdisciplinarity back into our studies and also turn the mirror to our own faces. How much pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, infodemic claims are there in peace research? Unfortunately, we also see these. I wasn't able to pinpoint uh, any article published on this since there is nothing published, but I have seen sometimes that in conferences, uh, colleagues shared uh, information, evidence or claims, videos and such uh, based on misinformation, conspiracy theories, whose source that they couldn't verify. And I was very worried about this. How can this be avoided? Uh, science literacy and the ideas of positive peace uh, should be supported. Uh, transparency as an issue needs to be studied because the less transparent you are, the more space you leave for these wrongful informations. And of course, peace education becomes very important. Now, a lot of people probably wouldn't see this as peace education, but in 2018, the French government started uh, a program which gives Twitter education to high school children in which they need to distinguish between wrong and right um, information. And then in Turkey, Bilgi University, in partnership with the public diplomacy division of NATO, they uh, created trainings, online trainings on infodemia and disinformation, again, which became very popular and successful. I myself subscribed and uh, got a certificate out of that. So these issues are out there. A lot of social sciences deal with them. Peace research is lagging behind. Let's catch up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Itira. You opened another world, <laughs> let's say, to us. Uh, this is fascinating to hear about pseudoscience and also uh, about also reminded me that uh, we are discussing quite a lot, especially in these last uh, uh, weeks, about uh, disinformation on lack of, well, not la lack of communication, but because we are lots of communication, lot of bad communication, and lo lo lots of disinformation about the vaccines and uh, categories of people to be vaccinated and so on, particularly in my own country, where the debate can be also very brutal and also violent in some contestations that happened in major cities. So the Novax movement. So that I have seen there are already colleagues studying them as a movement, a new movement, let's say. So, but I mean, this is another, another aspect that you, I mean, um, uh, I, I, I took inspiration from what you said. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, so we are, uh, now have the last speaker, Andrik, Andrik Bullens. Uh, do you have a PowerPoint, Andrik? Yes. Oh. Now I just act as the other room. I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah. Okay, so we now we are starting to see your present. Okay, perfect. All right. You can now present. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Although we are not many, on petit comité. Um, I 
would like to start with uh, thanking Ari and the other organizers uh, to devote this panel to the commemoration of uh, our colleague and friend, Olga Vorkunova, who died of COVID uh, at the beginning of the year. But I also would like to uh, remember one of our oldest colleagues and best friends, uh, Steve Wright, who passed away about two years ago. It also reminds us we are an aging organization. We need more new and fresh blood. We need more younger people. That said, uh, I was uh, happy to hear these two presentations of Petur and uh, Vidar. We did not communicate uh, before, uh, but uh, uh, both were, in fact, about uh, my topic. Uh, they both uh, talked about examples, concrete examples of good and bad. These are about uh, negative uh, attitudes uh, and how to change it, uh, a tour about pseudoscience and real science. And my topic is about uh, how these are examples of, let's simplify it, say, of good and bad. How did this come into the world? And I call this evolution. Uh, the term itself um, is not invented by me, but is from the 1990s. And it comes from uh, a music group, but with a complete um, different uh, meaning. So as the title says, evolution is on how did bad and good came into our world, starting from prehistory. And what does it mean for conflict and peace studies? I think this is a very important thing. And again, this has much in common with uh, what um, Atur talked about. There is not much about this. Uh, the whole topic of evolution is an anatim in conflict and peace studies. I didn't find anything. Uh, even in, um, I would say, the most important books of Johann Galtung, who is, uh, well, oftentimes referred to as the father of peace research. He also calls himself father of peace research in a book uh, by him and his friend, Dieter Fischer with the same name. Uh, in fact, the core of his theory, especially in uh, his books, I think they are the core books, uh, the earlier Peace by Peaceful Means, and then a theory of peace. Uh, even on the cover, he has this formula. What is peace? The nominator equity times harmony, and then in the denominator, uh, trauma times conflict. We talked about that, uh, Vida and I, a few times, and we agreed that there is something wrong with this uh, formula, because uh, uh, according to Galtung, uh, you create peace uh, by increasing the nominator and by decreasing the denominator. Now, if you imagine that you decrease conflict towards zero, so no more conflict, then the whole thing becomes zero. So this is a mathematical uh, problem. And uh, other 
others have criticized this as well. And uh, there is an, an article by Johan uh, where he says, you should not take this uh, too literally, just play with it. I, I think that's not a good uh, approach. Instead of that, to be very short, uh, my approach, which I call the dialectics of co-evolution, the core of it is that good and bad have evolved hand in hand through evolution. <clears throat> we go to some core points of the my approach, what I call DICE, which uh, also refers a little bit to uh, the famous uh, saying, God did not play DICE. Hmm. The core of it is that we consider not the absence or decrease of conflict, but how, but that conflicts are the core, the drivers of change in evolution, in history, and probably in personal life as well. They can be symmetrical, they can be asymmetrical. They can also uh, fall back, as we, for instance, see now in the in the several bloody civil wars. It draws upon Cartesian skepsis, doubt, so questioning. Um, it thinks in controversies. That is, by the way, uh, the way I teach. I never take a book and read it with uh, students from A, B, Z, but I take a problem uh, with controversial um, approaches. And then we start discussing pro and cons. Um, as far as I see it, is this approach much more value neutral and uh, it is non-religious, which uh, is different in Johann Galtung. He uh, has a very religious bias, uh, and, uh, but this is not the place to discuss that. Um, so my, in sum, research algorithm is logical empirical analysis, rational methodological critique, non-violent problem so solving, and also considering the impact of non-rational factors, such as emotions. And that is the core of dialectics in co-evolution, simplified thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and so on. It is a combination of Darwinian evolution theory and Marxian rev revolution theory. Things who normally are considered to be uh, exclusive, but they have much more in common than uh, you would think at face a value. Now, the dialectical co-evolution of species uh, is uh, addressed by Richard Dawkins, the famous uh, uh, evolutionary bi biologist. And he compares the dice as a dialectical co-evolution with an arms race. The real military arms race. And he says in evolution, uh, we find a lot of uh, examples. For instance, there is an arms race between the evolution 
of a predator like a tiger and its prey, the antelope. The tiger develops strength, the antelope uh, speed. And we have the flower and the bees, fox, rabbits, the queen, and, and the workers. And in fact, all parasite hosts like in humans, digestion, uh, bacteria, we need for uh, our body. Now, interesting is that dice is not only in biology, but also in the social, cultural, technical world. And that is, in fact, uh, a topic. Now, there are two versions, so to say. Dice always existed, always in parentheses, or it is a kind of counter reaction to a certain vital conflicts of interest between parties. It is based on, as I said, Marx Engels' dialectical triad of uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and then the next higher level for a new thesis. And the second pillar, DICE, is built on is the so-called activity theory of the cultural historical school from the early Soviet Union. Famous names connected with that is uh, Lev Vygotsky, uh, Luria, Leontjev, and others. Here are some examples to give you an idea of what I mean. The version always existed, energy and matter, matter and antimatter, absolute and relative, constancy and change, atom and universe or universes according to string theory. The second version is uh, the man-made examples of dice. Colonialism and liberation movements. Capitalism, socialism. Have, have not. Racist, anti-racist. World War II, the UN and the Declaration of Human Rights. The Vietnam War, anti-war, upheavals of 1960s, and so on and so on. Like we have Mozart's and we have Trump's, and they are always go together. It means that different, my uh, word, to Galtung, If you know or remember uh, his theory of peace, uh, in the first chapter, he has a, a chart, it's a, a diagram, a horizontal line and a vertical line. And in the upper right quadrant, which uh, refers to two parties and both win-win situations, the path to peace goes linearly up to the right. This in, is not the case in dice. Here is no linearity at all. It is uh, not only not linear, it is stochastic. It is open-ended. It is uncertain. It has no destination like evolution has no destination, it is uh, based on uh, chance, mutation, and all the other mechanisms in uh, evolution. Now, interesting is that this evolution, so where does the bad come from? This has triggered a huge debate, dispute, 
and a very aggressive one in uh, uh, peace studies, but also in uh, IR, in anthropology, archaeology, ethnology, genetics, and related sciences. So it is about where does the bad and the evil come from originally? How did it come up in evolution? How did it develop in history? And uh, I picked this up from uh, Nobel laureate Konrad Lorenz, who in the 60s wrote his famous The Sogenannte Böse, so-called evil, uh, a book on aggression. Here are a few examples of the bad, the evil um, in evolution, starting with the Gombe guerrilla war, who always were thought to be uh, relatively peaceful, but they fought and fight organized battles. Another, I don't have to explain this. This refers to this 16th century um, Black Death, the plague. the famous napalm girl in Vietnam, Kim Book. And this is the current refugee crisis. This is a, a refugee in the Moriak camp on the island of Lesbos, where I uh, do field research. And the most recent example is uh, from Nur Sultan Astana, where I teach at the University of Enu, and where there are the big upheavals and protests. And last night I heard that almost 10,000 people have been detained. How many killed, we do not know. Now, where does this bad come from? Religion always had a very simple answer. Uh, it is along with the good and it is all created by God. But of course, this is a very difficult topic for believers and for priests and church representatives because it begs the question of why an omnipotent, benign, benevolent God of love also permits the malicious, the bad, the evil, and everywhere in nature. How, how is that possible? It is a big contradiction um, in itself. The answer uh, we find in the so-called holy scripts, they are all the same in the Bible, in the Quran, in the Torah. It's the evil snake, Adam and Eve, the apple, the fall of man, expulsion from the paradise. And this contradiction is uh, summarized under the term theodicy. It comes from Greek, God, theos, and dike, which means just. So it stands for how religion explains or justifies, in parentheses, of course, the permission, the divine permission of evil, a contradictio in terminus. And it is then always said, this is a mystery of faith. You have to believe that. Now, if you have read Dawkins, The God Delusion, you will agree with me that this is really a fraud 
and a trick to deceive, frighten, intimidate, and control unknowing people. It comes from the first book, Genesis from the Old Testament. And it is said, God created um, the bat, so the lamb, so that the lion does not starve. I mean, this is really, uh, you, ha you have to, uh, to give it a second thought to understand how unrealistic, unlogic it is, especially because for, before the fall of man and the end of the paradise, it is said in the Bible that the lion and the lamb were living together. They lie next to one another. So the question was, what did the lion live upon then at that time? So, but that is not my point here. I just want to remind that uh, of uh, some 7 billion world citizens today, some one and a half billion are atheists and agnostics. Uh, and this number is growing. Now, here the point of how did this bed come into the world is also a big, huge dispute, conflictuous among uh, peace researchers, archaeologists, anthropologists, historians, primatologists. And it is, if you take a look at it, uh, this is a very harsh dispute, very harsh, especially from the side of the so-called peace researchers. And it started with uh, Lawrence Keeley's book, War Before Civilization, The Myth of the Peaceful Savage. Another one, Leblanc, Constant Battles, Why We Fight. Then there is the famous Steven Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. It all starts with Conrad Lawrence, as I said, on aggression, the so-called evil. And as I mentioned, Jane Goodall's The Gombe Chipanze War, and especially my countryman, Johan van der Dennen, the open letter to Franz de Waal, who is a primatologist, and uh, he says, well, my apes are all peaceful. And uh, what he calls the peace and harmony mafia in the 1990s. This is worth reading it. And then on the other hand, there are the people from the peace uh, research site, like Douglas Fry. He is a member of the International Peace Research Association and the American branch, Brian Ferguson, and uh, a famous book is War, Peace, and the Human Nature, where they reject um, the violent uh, nature and the violent uh, history of man in uh, evolution and history. Here is uh, the first part of uh, uh, of uh, Johan van der Dennis, open letter to the Peace and Harmony Mafia with the title Querela Pacis, which means uh, trouble with peace, which is uh, a peace in the 16th century written by Erasmus of Rotterdam, where he attacks uh, the church and uh, the aristocracy. 
Now, human nature, is it violent or peaceful? And I have done quite some research going back in prehistory to our ancient ancestors. And there we find uh, much empirical evidence of non-violence, especially in the pre-Neolithic times. Pre-Neolithic means before the end of the latest ice era, some 12,000 years ago. Before that, we have almost no evidence of uh, human violence, especially uh, of uh, uh, organized group violence. The personal violence may probably have always existed, uh, thief, theft, uh, and things like that. Now, the reason for that, I think, is, and most of uh, researchers uh, agree on that, not because our ancestors were very peaceful, but because there was no need to fight. There was this enough space, there was enough food for all, and especially uh, the population was very small. We had a lot of mass extinctions, and it is calculated by uh, a group of uh, researchers that uh, some 50,000 years ago, uh, sorry, some uh, 20,000 years ago, the group of uh, Homo was not more than 1,000 or 5,000. So Homo almost was exterminated. So there was no need to fight. And especially when they met other groups, they interbred, for instance, with Homo uh, Neanderthal or Denisova. Um, when their group were smaller as than possible rivals, they just evaded. They went out of the way. And this has been one of the reasons of migration, of mass migration, but that is uh, a research area I address in uh, another uh, paper. So, pre-Neolithic era, we have almost no violence. It is the period where there were no states, there was no hierarchy. And um, the only question still is, if there was violence, how much was it? How widespread was it? But most of the scientists uh, agree that it was compared to uh, uh, pre uh, post Neolithic times, minimal. Now, this changes around 12,000 years ago with the entry into the Neolithic sedentary and agriculture livelihood, which started in the so-called uh, golden triangle, which is uh, in uh, uh, which is between West Turkey and uh, the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. It was a very wealthy, uh, there was all kind of flora and fauna. Uh, so there was no need uh, 
to uh, for nomading anymore, so they just could collect what they needed to survive. Hendrik, Hendrik, I'm sorry. Uh, since we have uh, about 15 minutes left for discussion, if you can please yeah. try to go. We find. Yeah. Thank, thank you. We find the opposite. Did our ancestors made war or love? This is an old figure, 20,000 years old, found near Bethlehem. And what we also see is uh, violence, the warfare, had also a positive, progressive side because it revolutionized existing societal political, economic, and gender orders. It is dies in action. And especially in pre-Neolithic gather-hunter nomad times, women uh, participated as equals with men, also in hunting and warfare. They could climb very high social ranks. Here we have, for instance, uh, the queen, Boudicca, she was a Scottish queen uh, of a big tribe, and they fought the Romans uh, 2,000 years ago. Here we find the Amazons. They are not a legend. They were fighting uh, women from the Balkans and Russia. So... Here are the conclusions. In evolution, there was never a blank slate. Good and bad always went hand in hand. Good and bad was needed both for survival, especially in prehistoric times. Violence, the bad, is in our genes. It is part of our biological evolution. However, Today, this genetic basis is outdated. It is even dangerous because it is opposed to what we consider today as civilized pro-social human behavior. And that is where the nature-nurture conundrum comes in. So it is the millennia long process of civilization, science and technology, that created the cultural evolution, which is now the predominant side of human existence. It is what Aristotle uh, called uh, culture is the second nature of man. But there is no guarantee that it goes on. It is open and under undetermined, very fragile. It is a permanent challenge. And crucial is, it is not transported like in biology by the genes, but by memes. Memes are, that is Dawkins, cultural, scientific, technical, and ethical standard to be learned through comprehensive education and active participation in Conflict resolution. And this is the end. This will take a lot of time, a very long breath. And this is my reference to, in my eyes, the greatest philosopher of the Western world, maybe of the whole world, Woody Allen. Eternity is an awful long time, particularly towards the end. And we are just at the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hendrik. So I'm also happy that I didn't uh, cut in the end because you were already close to your conclusions. Uh, and we are just at the beginning, right? <laughs> and thank you, we are living very, very hard uh, times. Uh, so you have seen the 
uh, all uh, three uh, presentations have been brilliant and also very inspiring. So we have fifth, uh, 14 minutes now left for discussion and because we need to close uh, sharp uh, in 14 minutes because we need to uh, leave uh, the, the room to, to, to the, ne the next panel. Uh, so I... Um, I see if there is if there are people in the audience. So uh, I would like first to see whether there are questions in the audience before, uh, just in case, add some some ideas I have in mind. Anyone from the the audience, please. Can I say something? Oh, of course. <laughs> uh, first, first of all, uh, you don't have to stop at quarter two because at four we have the plenary. Okay, so Daniela, it's uh, so there is there is not session in this channel at four, but we have the plenary. So, so very brief. I mean, I I, um, I enjoy the presentations. I think they have to do with the core of this research. So just a few points to. To, to Niels, um, it was interesting that you referred a lot to uh, to our country. I see Ilan and I myself here in in Jerusalem, right? And to the conflict. Uh, so just a couple of, of points. One, for instance, Seeds of Peace, which is Aaron Miller's uh, uh, project in the US in a neutral territory for youngsters, Jews and, and Palestinians. Israeli Jews to meet. And I would say even at Hebrew you, because you, I mean, what was not clear whether you're talking about education for peace or education in general. At Hebrew you, we have in the last few years, a lot of uh, Palestinian students coming from East Jerusalem uh, or from Israel uh, itself. And I think the interaction with the Israeli Jews is, is very interesting, but but uh, you you gave us a report. I mean, my my question to the three of you: What is really the the, the problematic or the research question, right? That uh, because you, uh, 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 what is the uh, the the bottom line, right? Because uh, if it's you say that uh, it does not work within conflict, but uh, it has to work within political conflict. The same for Itir. I mean, Itir, if I pronounce that correctly, you gave us, this was really, really interesting, maybe too broad. It looks like an agenda what Peace Richard has to do, right? Uh, because it, it's really very, very broad. But again, what 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 is the, the, uh, the, the again, the bottom line, what, what you are suggesting that the Peace Research, I mean, we are having this conference because of that, <laughs> or part of that, right? So what to do about that? And, and last but not least to Henrik, that was a kind of encyclopedia and you could keep going. So just two points. One, it's interesting that you didn't talk at all about ethics. I mean, you talk about religion, but it's a, a, a good and bad, right? And, and again, it was not clear to me, uh, what was your argument? Because you start saying uh, good and bad is part of human condition. We have harmony, we have conflict, and uh, you don't like uh, Galtung, and I agree with you that bowling is much better than Galtung in that sense, right? But uh, at the end, you, you were moving, say, well, by the end of the day, we are moving from bad to good, like Pinker, etc. So again, and I would never quote Woody Allen. I don't think he's the big philosopher, not even uh, joking about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ari. Uh, is there any other comment from the audience? Otherwise, I, I had very, very few questions to everyone I had. Oh, Larissa, please. Yes, <laughs> hi. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed the presentations because they have these uh, different focuses. And I just have a small comment to the first one because I'm also very interested in this theory of um, enhancing contact and therewith declining prejudices and so on. Um, but when I wrote a, a term paper about Erasmus, I had this uh, point that there were also um, the selection bias because people might join such projects, like you, you mentioned the one between Palestinians and Israeli or Jewish families. Um, they are already interested in enhancing their contact and so on. I think that's a, that's a point that we have to keep in mind when talking about this um, kind of interventions to improve the relations between conflicting parties or the parties don't even have to be in conflict, but just 
be on, on different positions or sides. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Vera? Yes, hello. I, I hope you can see and hear me. Um, thanks so much. You can hear, by the way. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much for, for such interesting presentations. I uh, have a question for you here because um, I think it's, it's a fascinating area you're working on. Um, and I was wondering to what extent you also looked into security studies. I mean, it's, it's not the same, of course, or there are boundary issues with peace uh, research and peace studies. But nevertheless, if you look into security studies, um, in, um, you can find even some, maybe not yet academic publications, but at least policy related publications uh, with respect, for instance, even to deep fakes and use of deep fakes as you know, a weapon of new generation, which is I think also a, a very interesting issue and maybe um, this is also of relevance to your research. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. So it's good that we have collected so many questions. So at this point, given that we have few time, uh, I I leave uh, all the remaining minutes to you, okay, for a for a quick round of uh, feedbacks and replies and whatever you want to add. Uh, Vidar. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, uh, the general problem problem is that. It needs at least three articles, if not a book, to answer the question. The question is, what do we have of evidence that such projects, educational projects, to perforate or weaken intergroup boundaries, har hardship, and that they work at all? What, ev what evidence is there from solid external evaluation? The answer is not a lot. Uh, and then the next, second question is, is a bottom-up or top-down approach the best way to start such a process? Uh, I concluded that both are needed, actually. That was the implicit conclusion, because the top can always destroy a good bottom-up project. That's because of power relations internally in the groups. So I concluded that... <laughs> Both are needed. And in a way, the bottom-up projects have clear limitations when it comes to effects because of political power. Third, uh, does the approach of a close conflict that's close to your heart or your group or yourself or studying a distant conflict help most when it comes to seeing a conflict from both sides, both cognitively and emotionally? putting yourself in the other person's shoes, as they say. And very often it's totally unclear what one means, whether cognitively or emotionally. The answer was, which seems to be from the uh, Israeli studies, is that cognitively it helps quite a lot, or it helps actually more to study a distant conflict than a close one. The, un the not answered question is the other side of the story, can you then really say that you're, you're, you're seeing yourself in the situation of the other? That is so far, I can't give an answer to it, but, but, but the, those are the three problems I investigate. And I think actually is three articles, if not a book. Thanks. Ikea? Well, first of all, I would like to thank for all the questions. And now uh, Ari's question or uh, actually positioning, let's say, of where we need to stand on this is, is very worthy. Uh, and uh, I thank for this question because it allows me to add some points that I forgot during the presentation. And it is the fact that, for example, I didn't have much time actually to look at many of the peace research associated journals. I wanted to look at more journals. And I was debating this with Hendrik uh, at home, like which ones should I look and so on. Uh, but since they were more easily available, I looked at the Journal of Peace Research, Journal of Conflict Resolution, and the Journal of uh, Peace Education. And I especially kind of thought that the first two maybe were more towards peace science, quantitative studies, and the second one was a little bit more towards peace studies or peace research. But what I found out is actually somehow disturbed me. 
as a peace researcher or as a person who calls herself peace researcher. When I looked at the Journal of Peace uh, Research and the Journal of Conflict Resolution, I saw a lot of articles on nuclear issues, on rebel movements, on interstate conflict resolution or ethnic conflicts. But beyond that, anything that we understand within peace studies in terms of, let's say, promotion of positive peace, uh, internal dynamics and so on, they're completely missing. Uh, maybe there were some articles which touched upon uh, the women's position and the issues related to women in conflicts, but these were on conflicts and not in the society. There was nothing about domestic violence. There was nothing about government policies towards women and so on. So I was really surprised to see that. And when I looked at the Peace education, of course, you know, it is maybe difficult to take a look at the Journal of Peace Education as a, a very representative journal of the qualitative side of peace research. So I should include more journals into that study. But what I saw was that, okay, there was the contribution of yoga, dance, music to peace education. There was the contribution of different types of policies in education which may lead to more peace, but then the current issues such as, as I mentioned, inequality, populism, polarity in the societies, they're not there. It's as if the peace research community is both on qualitative and quantitative side, they have lost touch with the issues being debated in the mainstream daily lives of the people. This is very dangerous. This means that there is an academic and an intellectual detachment from the reality of the world, which wouldn't bring anything to peace research, which would mean that peace research is in stagnation. And I was very much afraid to see that. And I wanted to, then I felt even more determined to continue with the research. All of a sudden, seeing that there was nothing, I thought that it was my duty to highlight that this was there. So I think if we focus on what issues currently challenge our societies that obstruct us from reaching to negative or positive peace, we should recreate a new agenda in terms of what innovations, new topics that we have been neglecting. And that would be something that I would like to contribute. So actually, maybe uh, in the previous presentations that I did in other conferences of either UPRA or the European Peace Science Conferences, uh, I brought this issue up very frequently. But I think pinpointing where our research agenda fails us is very important to go forward. And uh, especially what Vera said about uh, security studies. Last night, as a last resort, having found nothing about 